Welcome, welcome to this evening's Works in Process. Since its inception, American Ballet Theatre's repertoire has been celebrated uh, for its quality, for its eclecticism. Uh, and that continues today. In any one night, you may see one of the great classics, you may see modern masterpieces, or you may see new repertoire. So tonight, we're going to talk about the repertoire at ABT, but mainly new repertoire. Um, and we're going to talk about it from the point of view of dancers, dance makers, and dance lovers. But before we start, we're going to enjoy a pas de deux that was recently new repertoire. It's uh, the Elegy Pas de deux from With a Chance of Rain by Liam Scarlett. The music is Rachmaninoff, played by Emily Wong. And the dancers are Isabella Boylston and Tom Forster.
So please join me in welcoming the beloved ballerina from American Ballet Theatre, Gillian Murphy. Hello, sweetheart. So uh, I want to talk to you about dancing at ABT and repertoire, but let's, uh, let's go back to the beginning. So where, where are you from in America? Where were you born? Well, I was actually born in England. Oh, you were? <laughs> True question. <laughs> um, my father was working overseas for a few years. Um, but I grew up in South Carolina. Okay. I have two older brothers and younger sister who were all born in the U.S. And I always had an American passport. And So, um, yeah, I grew up in South Carolina. So you ended up at North Carolina School for the Arts. That's not such a big stretch, just up the road, right? I was lucky to go there, yeah. Right. And... Who, uh, well, that's where you had a very important influence as a teacher there, right? Melissa Hayden. Melissa Hayden was awesome. Um, certainly legendary as a ballerina, but also her coaching and right. her classes were super tough and um, defined me as a dancer. Right. So you came to ABT, you auditioned, <coughs> got into the court of ballet. And that's where Georgina Parkinson became a, a figure in your career as well, an important figure, right? It's true. She actually spotted me at North Carolina School of the Arts. Oh, she did? When I was 16. Um, I was working on Le Pateneur, and she came down for a weekend to help us get it together. And I was doing the Fuerte Girl. And uh, she pulled me aside and said, uh, I think you're ABT material, and uh, you should come up to New York and audition. Well, she did. I came up uh, in April of 96 and uh, was offered a contract to join two days later. But you mean uh, to start two yeah. days later? Wow. Yeah. And well, did you? Uh, no, because I felt that I needed to graduate from high school. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and fortunately, Kevin McKenzie was uh, actually respected that very much and was like that's great and it's good that you feel strongly about that and can you join in August which so, you did which I did so you you had a pretty big technique always right I always felt comfortable turning and jumping right yes an extension was not bad either no. not bad no <laughs> yeah so how how soon did you get roles at ABT uh, did you have soloist roles when you were in the core um, the first year, I wasn't doing so much. There was a really strong senior quarter ballet. So even to, to get into the quarter ballet roles, the mm -hmm. shades and uh, the willies and the swans and everything wasn't like an automatic thing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, by the end of the, my first Met season, I was doing uh, a number of core roles. Mm -hmm. And by the following Met season, I was actually starting to do... I, was doing more and more of the quarter ballet roles and then some featured solos as well. Um, I think one of the first classical solos I did was a third Odalesque in Le Corsair. Oh, yeah, well, you made that your own. I had an extra turn. You did, <laughs> and everybody uh, does it from now on. We call it the Gillian Murphy solo. Everyone oh, knows it as okay. that. Yes, 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 yes. As a matter of fact, I was just looking at it the other day, but yes. So... What was the first big principal role you did, ABT? Uh, when I was still a soloist, actually when I was still in the quarter ballet, I was, I got kind of thrown into, I got thrown into Myrta. Uh, oh, yeah. there, was a, there was an injury and so I had two days to learn Myrta. Queen of the um, Willies and Giselle. Yes, and I was 19 and I, I uh, had a big season that year because um, I was also doing, I think I was doing Golnar and a bunch of other solos. And um, the Myrta, though, I was like, 
whoa, <laughs> like, I don't have that kind of maturity to be dancing the queen of the wheelies. Like she has to, at 19. she has to like set the tone for the second right. act. And I was like, <laughs> and. Um, so who helped you with that? Well, I had two days to learn the role. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and um, that was actually the first year that I was dating Ethan Stiefel, who's mm -hmm. 19 years later, we're married. Um, and, um, but he actually gave me some great advice. Um, I was like, I'm not even remotely ready artistically to do this role. And he was like, you know, you, you don't have to worry about the steps. You naturally have stamina and the jump and there isn't like a particular step you need to worry about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just think about what your point of view is and who you are as a character and enjoy it. And you had a big success, I'm sure. It was, right? it was good advice. It was advice. a great role for you. I, I love it. Yeah. Um, it's fun to um, play the evil characters every now and then. What was your first three actor? Uh, Keytree was my first really? full-length leading role. I was a soloist at the time. And uh, I did Swan Lake shortly thereafter. And really? then I was promoted to principal, I think. And was there, you had a big technique, but it's one thing to have a big technique. There's another thing to to get through a three-act ballet and be as good at, at the end of the third act as you are in the beginning. Did you find that was difficult, or did, did that sort um, of... I don't... I think I... You know, I played around outside my old childhood and was dancing growing up every day, pretty mm -hmm. much, and I feel like I'm naturally kind of fairly you strong, and I have stamina. I remember when I first did Keytree, it was my first full-length lead, and... The part that I was most nervous about was the the mime scene in the second act, <laughs> because uh, <laughs> I just I'm naturally a bit shy and um, most people worry about the fuetes. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I know it's an unusual choice, but I was really worried that I was just gonna sort of be really self-conscious and not mm. go for like right. Keytree being um, kind of over the top mm -hmm. and really like kind of, you have to kind of ham it up which I was mm -hmm. a little uncomfortable about right. um, in the studio and then when I got on stage I felt totally fine right. but um, so those are the types of things that I would get nervous about right. early on so did you you started doing contemporary work some of the maybe DeMille or Tudor yeah. mm -hmm. and then there were new re new pieces always being created at ABT what what was it like uh, as a dancer in a rehearsal period, maybe seven hours of rehearsal straight, and you go from one style to another? Yeah. It's, Did you find that a challenge? It is a challenge. Um, actually, one of the, my breakthrough role that really got me into the doing solos was actually Twilight Tharp's The Elements. Oh. Um, so that's a, in jazz shoes and... Um, somehow I was learning um, Kathleen Moore's role, so that was already a big opportunity to learn the role. And um, uh, Beth Farrell, who was the most rock solid senior core member, mm -hmm. uh, actually got sick for like the only time ever on tour, and I got thrown into that performance. So my first big sort of featured role in ABT was a contemporary really? role in, in that Twilight Art Ballet. Um, in terms of doing seven hours of after hour and a half class of um, various repertoire, um, I think I can speak for everyone that we mm -hmm. love that mm -hmm. the variety that we have at ABT mm -hmm. and the the diversity of the styles and um, you know each hour is like can be really different. Right. Um, it can take a bit of a toll on one's body, and uh, it's also a challenge. I remember one season I was doing Black Tuesday by Paul right, Taylor, right. and um, I had to be a street lady. I don't know if it's the other way of saying that. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, so really, like down into the ground, wearing heels, um, and the style was just very like she's been beaten and used, and just she's you know, at the end of her tether. Mm -hmm. And then, like, the next rehearsal would be theme and variations. <laughs> really? <laughs> in point well, shoes. That, yeah, that's going to be very up, difficult. Up and right. bright and, and joyful. And fast and fashion. turned out. And, right, and then right. that kind of, that was, yeah, that was really difficult. And actually doing the reverse, doing a, the theme rehearsal before the Black Tuesday was also 
difficult because the lady who was working on the Paul Taylor piece was like, you really need to get down into the ground, like you need your weight to be down, you need to feel like, you know, beaten up and just, right. uh, and I was like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, up, I'm ready for it. Yeah, it was like yeah. actually yeah. very challenging. Right. I think it was a little frustrating for, for her actually at that moment. Um, and I think I got better at doing at going from the different styles right. over time. A few years okay. ago, uh, Alexei Retmansky choreographed a new Nutcracker for ABT, and you were the original Clara, right? Yes. And that is one of the fiercest roles. I mean, that tough. Chal that challenges my stamina every time. It did, yes, and it still does. Still does every time. It doesn't get easier. It's very intense. But you were there creating that. I mean, part of that is yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you must uh, sort of curse the fact that you did that in the rehearsal studio and now you have to do it in performance, right? I guess so. Yeah. I have heard dancers say that before, like, oh, maybe we should just tone it down a little. Yeah, that's like, you know, one dancer the other day was like, I was really on my leg today and I'm afraid he thinks I'm going to be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, sometimes you set yourself up for like right. even bigger challenges. Did you find that, that that you had then more stamina for other roles after having worked on Clara? Um, yeah, I, I think so. And I think you know, since I've been with the company for 21 years, um, I still feel good and strong. But uh, I feel like I've learned how to pace myself right. a little right. better. Like you don't, because um, I'm naturally sort of quick to fire my muscles yeah. like I actually can I've learned how to just be a little more calm you don't have to like push for every right. moment right, right, right. Um, right. so that also creates more stamina you said earlier we were talking you talked about your favorite role created on you ever was by Ethan that's true tell us about it in New, in New Zealand yeah, yeah. Um, when I was I was dancing um, for half the year for three years at the Royal New Zealand Ballet when uh, my husband was the director there. And he created a ballet called Beer Hall, which is set in a Bavarian beer hall. And it's it's a comedy. It's so cute. And I was the beer maiden. <laughs> so um, In point yeah. shoes? In point shoes. Super challenging, classical technique involved. Um, so there's a lot of like hilarity and I'm, uh, I was serving like beer and sausages around to the various characters on the stage. And then, um, and then my character and a hunter actually have like a real love and they come together for this beautiful pas de deux. And then I have a really difficult solo and a difficult coda. Um, so for me, it was the perfect mix of, you know, Ethan knows me better than anyone. Mm -hmm. So he created, the role completely with me in mind and, right. and with my te technique and my um, personality and my sense right. of humor in mind, I think. Right. So um, it was just really so fun, but also challenging, which I, I definitely enjoy right. that right. Yeah. that mix. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Sure. We, we uh, are going to see you dance later tonight. Yes. And we look forward to, to that and okay. to seeing you dance at the season Thank soon. You. Thank you. Now let's, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the point of view of new rep from a dance maker who's right in the middle of, of making a new work for this, the upcoming fall season, Benjamin Milpier. You've you got more mics than you need here. Yes. So, uh, yes. So uh, before we get into s talking about the new work, let's just talk a little bit about uh, your beginnings a as a dancer. You started in France. Um, well, I was born in France, but I quickly moved to Senegal when I was a few months old. To Senegal? Yeah. My father was a decathlete oh, really? and a musician, and we moved there. My father was training athletes in Senegal. My mother was a dance teacher, so essentially I started in Senegal with African uh, and eventually modern dance. But I really grew up with, you know, West African rhythms and, uh, and African dance, which I did throughout my, my whole childhood. You know, my mother was actually a, a fantastic 
I think, modern dancer and African dancer. And um, always had, you know, we, we actually, we lived next to a very important family of drummers, uh, the Dudu Dian Rose family, which have, Dudu Dian Rose has 10 wives and 40 children, and they're the most, <laughs> They're the most, uh, you, know, very, you know, they've toured the world. Maybe some of you might know the, you know, the music, uh, but uh, the dancing and the rhythms of West Africa is, are, are just absolutely, uh, is absolutely amazing. Um, so I was lucky to, to have that early influence. You know, I came to ballet much later. Wow. So, okay, fast forward to, how did you get to New York City Ballet from Senegal? Well, we moved back to France when I was five. Okay. Um, and, you know, I was still doing, a lot of modern dance in Africa. My mother, we had a studio in the house. And I really think, you know, eventually I started to watch, you know, on Saturday nights uh, on television, I and mean, I think it was on Channel 3, there was American movies, so they were Westerns, so John Ford Westerns and John Wayne Westerns, I was growing up, which I loved, and then musicals. And eventually, White Nights. You know, I think that was um, a defining moment. Uh, and I realized then I couldn't go get the turning point on VHS. And seeing, you know, American Ballet Theater mm -hmm. and, you know, and Baryshnikov and everything. Mm -hmm. the, the ballet in France was well promoted and, you know, ballet is on the 8 o'clock news all the time. Um, so there was also the Paris Opera, mm -hmm. which, you know, I started ballet by the time I saw Baryshnikov dance because it sort of combined all the things that I was, I mean, I, I was on the track and field, you know, as a kid. Oh, really? Um, I was doing percussions. Um, so I was a, an athletic kid, but ballet, when I saw Misha, was the, you know, something that really excited me. So, um, yeah, so I've sort of had it in the back of my mind somehow that it wasn't Paris Opera I wanted to go to, uh, but it was New York, New York, you know, because there was something really, if, you know, if, 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 if Bershnikov was in New York, somehow it must be the place. So did you get to SAB? Is that where you... Yeah, I, you know, I went, uh, by the time I was 13 years old, and I knew I wanted to be a ballet dancer, it was clear there was nowhere else to go in my town. Mm -hmm. um, and my mother sent me, I had started with the Opera House. The Opera House had a director at the time, a, a Russian director, Vladimir Skuratov, who had danced with the Ballet Russe, who was really an amazing uh, man artist. And I was lucky enough to dance in the productions early there mm -hmm. of Fille Malgarde and Sleeping Beauty and, you know, this early experiences in the theater in that stunning, stunning opera house. This is um, Lyon. No, Bordeaux. Oh. That was Bordeaux. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, which is really a beautiful place. So that was my, my early experience. Um, and we w I went to Lyon. It was a total coincidence. There were two conservatoires. There's, you know, either Paris Opera School or oh. Conservatoire in Paris and Lyon. They're the two national schools outside of, outside of Paris. Um, and the Paris Opera had a documentary at the time that uh, was really frightening, you know, of how the children were treated. Right. Oh, yeah. It's funny that, you know, after all these years, and I've said when I ended up going back to Paris Opera in a very different yes, position right. and yeah. still kept, you know, decided to keep the, the institution and, and, and at, at length. But, um, but so by the time I was, yeah, I went to Lyon, coincidence, I actually auditioned in the contemporary section because I had only two years of ballet behind me. And my mom never thought I would be, uh, you know, taken into the school because there was an age limit and I was too young. And so I actually got into school and it was a fantastic time because uh, my teacher, I, I got into the contemporary section, not in the ballet section, and um, Marie-France Dieulevin, who was a really, Cunningham adept at the time was the, te the main teacher, and so I studied Cunningham for a year essentially, oh, really? and had fantastic, you know, teachers that were coming to the school. I mean, it was a f it was fantastic school, you know, music and art, and one of the great dance history teachers France ever had, Laurence Loop. Um, so I was really lucky that year, and then the next year came um, Michel Rann and Annette Glushak, uh, and I and I wanted to go into the you know I wanted to ballet, yeah, and I went to ballet section. I mean Michel became the teacher of, at the school, and then I you know he invited me over to the house and he showed me I think Stars and Stripes was probably like the first Valentine ballet that I saw, mm -hmm. um, and Allegro Brilliant and. And I had a friend who was a violinist and was studying at Juilliard and would come back to, to Lyon and would show us, pro, you know, would show me programs of American Ballet Theater. And, but by, the, by that time, I, I knew I wanted, you know, when I saw my first Balanchine Ballet, something about music and movement completely mm -hmm. connected mm -hmm. in ways that, you know, I, I probably couldn't explain right. at the time, but it just made so much sense to me. Yeah. The moment you dance <coughs> Balanchine for the first time and it fits you like a glove and fits the music, it's just an amazing 
feeling. Yeah, it was. I think um, you know, it just it just the, seeing these dancers. It was. I remember Meryl Ashley yeah. and Sean Labor in Stars and Stripes on some gig yeah. somewhere with some bootleg tape. Um, yeah, it just it was a kind of a joy and a uh, something so natural right. that that, right. that that made total sense. So yeah. I auditioned for SAB and uh, and got accepted. Came for the summer. And, and Jerry so Robbins was was important in. It, he was. I was. I was so lucky. The year that I arrived in New York, Jerry choreographed a ballet for the school, which was the two and three part inventions. Mm -hmm. um, which you know, at 15, was like just incredible. Um, how much, you know, like, what an influence he was. Uh, how much he communicated to us. And you know, we, we kept working. You know, I was lucky. I was in Brandenburg and uh, Linos, which he revived for us. And you know, I was. He was one of the reasons I got quickly into the company. I think right. he believed in me. Right. Yeah. Okay, so you're in the company. Had you thought about choreographing at this point? Did you always want to? Well, you know, it, dancing started, you know, when I, was a, when I was a kid. The reason I, this is a funny story, I, um, you know, I basically, I was surrounded with music. I loved music. And uh, the way that I started dancing was not by going into classes, was really by making dances, you know, at five years old, in my room, using songs, you know. So the funny story is the first time I went on stage was something I choreographed. And I picked this really beautiful music. It was The Dying Swan. <laughs> you know, the Dying Swan. And I remember, you know, I, it was funny, the theatrical, you know, um, ideas i put a stool very high in the wings my mother was like what are you doing i was like well i'm, I'm going to leap on the stage and look like i'm looking really high so that was one of the first uh, my first uh, but pretty much every time i went on stage I, my mother would just let me make dances and then when i would come home from lyon i made dances on the school so it was always very much linked with this you know what the image you know the the, the images and the imagination that music uh, gave me mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and so I knew I, you know, I always listened to music throughout the first years at City Ballet, and when the, when I was promoted to soloist, I felt okay, you know, I've gone at least somewhere that I, you know, now I can start to really think about choreographing, and uh, I wanted to, you know, it's not something, it's just, you know, it's like it's life or death, you know, it's like uh, that Rena Maria Wilke, you know, book, yeah. you know, it's just it's something that, you know, I'm happiest when I'm in the studio working yeah. with dancers, basically. So you had a wonderful career as a dancer you began to make notice as a choreographer. People were taking notice of you, and uh, that kind of leads into, very fast forwarding now, to um, the LA Dance Project. Tell us about that, how you, how you decided to, well, how did that come about? I think o over time, being you know, in a ballet company and being part of the ballet world, um, I you know, always was thinking about really what, yeah, directing, essentially, mm -hmm. you know, um, not just the work that I would be interested in doing, but what a modern ballet company, you right. know, would be, should be like, in my view, or, so, I probably had too, you know, too many opinions, you know, as a dancer, um, and, but I was always, it was always in the back of my mind, so eventually, you know, I decided to, to stop quite fat, quite early, um, Partly because I, I had danced the repertory, and I, I, I was having. I realized the, the the older you get in ballet, the longer you need. The longer, the more time you need to spend in the studio. Right. You know, you need to get there earlier to warm up. You need yeah, to get stay later true. to stretch. And that was just not. My mind was interested in other right. things, right. and I was not willing to give it that kind of time. And I also was so much about the sensation. I mean, I loved. You know, all those balancing ballets where I got to jump and turn and, and the sensations that I had on stage in those days were like so extraordinary that I, the way that I remember them that I, I didn't want to have a diminished version of that. Even though, you know, maturity becomes something really important. Right. You know, by the time you get 28, 29, you really, 30, you, you, you know, you do yeah. your best dancing. But I wanted to turn the page and I um, was after Black Swan and you know my wife had a place in Los Angeles and I had been interested in LA for years before that. I mean, I, I had my first meeting with the head of the music center, the, you know, the president of the music center um, who does the fundraising, Jen Jelanko, I think in 2006. So whenever I would go to LA, I would always stay, rent a car and just stay in the city, drive around and was just fascinated by, you know, 
by it. And we talked early on about, you know, how could we, I knew that there was a terrible reputation with Los Angeles and dance. It was very hard, you know, that um, very hard to build dance and no one had succeeded right. and so right. forth. And um, by the time, you know, Jane at that point called me and said, you know, that I, I was starting to spend a little more time in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. It's between New York and LA. And she said, well, what if we, you know, can raise some money to get something started? Um, and so I did. Right. Um, I had already had produced enough shows. I danced in, you know, uh, gigs um, with, you know, in Lyon and London, all kind of all right. over. Um, so I started to have some experience of how to do that. And, you know, LA Dance Project started and yeah, four years, five years ago now. So the idea was always mainly new repertory, right? <clears throat> yeah, I... It was going to be different you know, from City it, Ballet, for yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one thing that I didn't want was... The thing, the thing with me that's maybe a little bit different from other kind of dancers who've had a ballet career is, you know, I have this background, it's not conventional, it means I was not just put in ballet classes at age eight, like I, I came through modern dance and African dance and, you know, went to Lyon and at Cunningham and so, you know, I, I, I love dance at large and anyway I feel that it's very, it would be very difficult if let's say I was only able to commission, you know, ballet only because I feel there's not even good, there's not enough good new ballet today to really fill up like a whole season and I just love dance at large. I'm interested in in very much in pairing works, you know, I think this country has extraordinary repertory, modern dance repertory that's not seen, the, the performing arts are having a right. terrible time everywhere, you know, it's, it's more and more difficult to raise money. You know, so all these things kind of interested me and I mm -hmm. wanted to kind of, you know, I was like, well, how exciting is it if you can put to get, bring back something and put it together with something new mm -hmm. and really, you know, how do you create an event? How, you do, how do you get people in the theaters? So right. all, all those, you know, and so LA Dance Project was a great place to begin. I think, um, you know, maybe that maybe sometimes I have, I have too many ideas and things need to get a little bit more focused right. in the kind of what it is that the company is really about. But... It's also important to, to experiment and try things. And, right. and, and that led me to Paris right. where, you know, which was a fantastic experience because taking on Well, Paris, it could be a more different company from LA Dance Project. Yeah, but at the end of the day, you know, my heart was in, is, in, is in ballet. I mean, I, mm -hmm. that's what I danced for you know, nearly 20 years. And, um, you know, I spent a lot of time studying like the history of that company and the history of ballet before I went there to kind of make a decision and say, well, this is where I think we should be taking things, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which was very, you know, my, my vision of it, my understanding of the history of it, I think was very, uh, it was. It was a. It wasn't like doing this for the company. It was like doing this, this for the company. Right, right hand turn. And and um, you know there was multiple reasons, mm -hmm. but it quickly felt like you know you can't like as Misha said in an article about after I resigned, like, you can't change the words to La Marseillaise. You know, <laughs> it 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 very felt you quickly felt like you know I I understood that it was not going to work, you know, it wasn't going to work with my, the, how, where I wanted to take with things, vision, and right. um, I wanted to, you know, I particularly have to say, it's also, you know, in this life, you know, you only have one life, like in this right. lifetime, I would be, I'm so interested in the idea of creating something that is going to succeed in the performing arts, you know, you know because it's really hard, you know, it, it, it's, just all, it's all private money. I mean, I was in Europe, there's right. less and less public money, yeah, and it's everywhere. Different. You know, mm -hmm. if you don't sort of create a new model, if you don't, you know, create work that's relevant for uh, young people who are now, we're fighting with, you know, it's a fight with technology now because, you know, we have this disease called the, our iPhone that, you know, that, that's essentially hijacking our brains, but it's true, it's true, and it's, 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 it's very much something that's taking, you know, um, attention from, you know, the beauty of the theater is that right. none of you are right. going to check your phones while you're here, right. okay, <laughs> people have to pay attention, but that's, so that's, you know, that's what I want, I want to, to create meaningful experience for right. people and, and figure out a way to have a company that that works that's sustainable, you know, in 2017, right. um, which is kind of doing the impossible, to be right. honest. Right. Um, right. But that interests me. So this brings us to what we're going to see a little bit of soon. You're doing a new work. You're actually doing two new works for American Ballet Theatre, right, for the fall season. Yes. So uh, let's talk briefly about 
the one work which we're not going to see tonight, and then talk a little more about the second work. So the f the second work. So I, I I wanted to use the you know the the, the theater of the Co the Coke Theater, the New York State Theater, as I like to call it. Um, right. Is uh, <laughs> you know has this promenade that you spend you know that you spend time in an admission. Yeah. Um, and if you really look at the space, it's not really a functional space in the sense that you know it has all these balconies that people don't necessarily walk around of it's a beautiful space you know it's an int really interesting space uh, an architect that i love um and I, I i really wanted to use it um and there was there's several ideas uh, you know there's not just the way that i'm going to do it now but there's other other ways because you have this ability to see close to see from high to see um, so I decided to create a work that takes, will take place on the three balconies that are on the plaza side, mm -hmm. um, because in fact the audience can really see from anywhere. You know, you can be across on all the balconies, you can be on the ground floor, and you can look up. So I have about almost 30 dancers placed across the three balconies, and the dance. You know, it's simple. It's not. It's almost. You know, I'm doing something that's not very long. It's barely. F it's five minutes. It's a, a, a piece called uh, New York Counterpoint by Steve Reich. And it's really this giant counterpoint for 24 dancers. That, and this that will, be will be in the intermission? You know, yeah, this will mm -hmm. be in an intermission. Um, yeah, at least four or five times, I think, we're, we're performing it. And this is, it premieres the night that uh, I Feel the Earth Move is going to premiere as well, correct? Yeah, it premieres the same night as I Feel the Earth Move. Um, but, you know, it was just something that to use the space as a theatrical space, right. you know, sort of something that... You know, we spend we spend all this money on big sets and you know create. You know, I mean, I've been I've been doing a lot of that. I mean, we we using the environment and you know, our, you, know you know houses. You know, we did projects at the Schindler House in LA and the Philip Johnson House here, um, and sort of using these natural environments for performance, right. uh, which is something that I've that I think is is really interesting because it just it, 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 I think one of the you can't just wait. You know, we also. Paris Opera was an exception because the the building is so magnificent that and and old in a way that it just draws people, right? So the the building itself draws people. I think we were making something ridiculous, like three million in visits a year. Something mm -hmm. unbelievable unbelievable. But the theater of the fifties are diff more difficult. You know, they were built at a at a time, they were at a different time when there were more audience, you know, there are these temples that you know, there's a, a new generation of people maybe are having a harder time to to go into. You know, mm -hmm. so it's also revisiting these spaces and bringing performance. You can't just wait for people to go in the theater. You have to go to the people as right. well. Yeah. And when you start to think that the world can be your playground and the world can be your performance space, it's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah, we did this opera in the train station in LA three years ago, which is a you know the train the the, the basically the station is. You know, full time working. There's people taking the trains. It's this beautiful 1927 um, Art Deco um, station, and in the room was an orchestra, and 200 people came, and we would put put on wireless headphones and started to listen to the orchestra, and then we'd open the doors, and the opera would take place in the in the station, you know, with the dancers and opera singing into mics, and you could so, sort of you had this experience of live theater with the spontaneity of, you know, just life wow. going. You know, it was about, it was after the Invisible Cities by Italo Calvino. Yeah, which was a beautiful, beautiful thing. So the other piece you're going to do, you have some beautiful dancers waiting to work with you on stage. So you want to set up a little bit about what we're going to see? Uh, yeah, I mean, and so, you know, this piece, I mean, every, Every piece is different in the sense that you fall in love with the different scores. But there's also, I find myself very much uh, sensitive to, you know, while I use the classical form and classical composition, ballet, and, and music, um, I, I mainly like to, I'm interested in human relationships. I'm interested in this moment in time, you know, and the moment that I'm in and, you know, how, how people interact in the world. So that's v often in the pieces is really what I what I lean towards. And and you know it was interesting. I was I was in Paris the during you know in the worst possible time. You know there were all the terror attacks. You know um, I had to keep 
two twenty five hundred people in the theater in Bastille the night the, that terrible mm -hmm. night mm -hmm. because things were always happening on the street. And then I premiered a piece in Brexit uh, in London. It was the day of Brexit, <laughs> and you know. Well, and then I come back to in to in America. Two weeks time, and, we're going to premiere and here. It, and but but it was very Paris was very uh, troubling at the time. You know, it was we had to get all the security in the theater. We had you know it was it was not an uh, easy time to be in Paris, and you know I think it was not it's not the moment where I can just make a work, you know, about. You know, just to take a piece of music, and you know, I, I definitely had to sort of think about what what would be the right. Yeah, it's these unconscious things that you know come to you, and so in, that are revealed in this piece. So this piece is called "I Feel the Earth Move," which is very much how the world feels right now. It's right. just you know this uh, crazy stuff going on mm -hmm. all over the place. You know, the the nature was you know responding. I mean, everything seems chaotic in a way that I've never had to experience the world. I've right. been very lucky. I've been living in a, you know, very... So there's a feeling of uncertainty, you know, which when you have children and you have... is also something that, that, that you think about. So the, the work really is... The first movement is called Tremor, which I think... which I aim for is really to show that sense of uncertainty and maybe even feeling that, you know, safety is not something that is so obvious anymore, necessarily, or who knows, you know, and it's also, it could also relate to other things that have happened in the world in the past, or, so that's the first movement. The second movement is called a vision, which has 12, 12, uh, 15 women dancing together, um, and also has some symbols in it um, of gestures and things that I think, um, come together nicely, you know, when, when you'll see the piece. And the last movement is called The Work Begins, which is this, you know, I used um, 1970s songs by Philip Glass with Paul Simon, David Byrne, and Laurie Anderson that he reorchestrated, uh, which the last movement really for me is this, it's about, you know, the, the energy and the joy and the kind of, this burst of energy of people coming together and it's full, filled with hope and um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's the piece. So, so you know, don't you expect too many, you know, there's mise-en-scene that's not here, there's, I'm going to start working with uh, David Hallberg and Misty Copeland on, in the first movement. We want, you know, there's a whole solo that, that um, begins before the duet uh, with Misty and David and I chose them together for a very specific reason as well. And you know, we, we wanted the, to talk a little bit more about you know what I'm what I work on you know in the studio. You know, there's a there's an approach to movement that is very much linked to my background. You know, I, I in in my ballets I want the, the back to move in a certain way. You know, and, and release, and that's really all from this early background that I had with African dance, you know, kind of a sense of movement and how to. Eat move in space, like just to eat up space and, um, and, and reach and sort of have this larger than life quality. Uh, but I've also been really fascinated uh, with recently with all this that's going on in, in f coming from street dance and freestyle and you know, all these things where you've, you're, you're looking at dancers that have outstanding musicality and virtuosity and speed and, you know, so all these elements, you know, I think, I think like movement quality and changes of movement quality within a dance very fast and trying to create interesting intricate combinations that you know keep the viewer engaged like all of the, some of the things that have been that, that we, we've been working on um, and really the sensation of how these dancers feel in, in space on stage how they use their hands how they, how they use their head how how they can shift from one movement quality to the other with complete control. Um, that's some of the things that we've been working on okay. in this piece. Okay. okay. So. so let's see uh, David and Misty. Oh. <laughs> How are you? Okay, let's go. How are you? <laughs> you uh, let's go maybe just from the section where um, you're on the floor after, uh, right before the duet, okay? So there's a solo that begins uh, the piece, uh, which David is really beautiful in, but you'll have to come see it <laughs> um, to see him uh, in that solo. So we'll go from the duet stuff. <laughs> So 
Jesus and the Ghost has ever read. And now the Einstein Trail is like the Einstein on the beach. So if you know the facts, so this would happen what I saw in Lucy or a kite, you raced all the way up. This is a race. So this one will have eight in types into the pink rink. So this way could be so very magic. This could be like seeing where a woman comes out to grab her, so this way she grabbed her. So this could be if you lie on the grass. So this could be where if the earth move or not. So here we go. I feel the earth move under my feet. I feel tumbling down, tumbling down. I feel some ostriches and walk into a satchel, some micro. I went to the window and wanted to draw the earth. So when David Cassidy tells you, all of you, get on going, get going, get going, get going. So this could be like the way we see. J. Reynolds from midnight to 6 a.m. Harry Harrison from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Ron Lundy from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Steve O'Brien from 4 p.m. to 6 a.m. Steve O'Brien from 4 p.m. to 6 a.m. Okay, good. Johnny Donovan. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, good. It needs a little more space. Okay. Yeah. Let's make this sharp diagonal this time. Let's, yeah, let's, let's start. Let's go from here. And when you start, um, right away, go a little further. With so, yeah, so... So there's a little bit, so a little bit more extension, so a little bit more cl uh, clarity. You can take things a little further. All right. Shum, keep moving. Boom. Over oh, dance. Good. Here. Uh, this is good. And, and then reach right away. Boom. Go. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Keep. Keep. Coming, come back to that hand before you offer and then go to dance with him. Yeah, let's do that again. Yeah, should think really moving through space with a knife. <laughs> really articulated to show all these shapes. Yeah, again. Christmas trees, the Santa Claus has it over and now the Einstein Trail is like the Einstein on the beach. So if you know the f -f 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 facts, so this would happen what I saw in Lucy or a kite, you raced all the way up. This is a race. So this one will have eight in types into the pink rink. So this way could be so very magic. This could be like seeing where a woman comes out to grab her, so this way she grabbed her. So this could be if you lie on the grass. So this could be where if the earth move or not. So here we go. I feel the earth move under my feet. I feel tumbling down, tumbling down. I feel some ostriches and walk into a satchel, some micro. I went to the window and wanted to draw the earth, so when David Cassidy tells you all of you, get on going, get nice, going, get going, get nice. going, so this could be like the way we see. J. Reynolds from midnight to 6 a.m. Harry Harrison. Let's put it down faster here. Good, good. Yeah, good. That was much better. That was much better. Yeah, still you can put it down faster here uh, after she pushes you. And you go, oops, sorry, let's do that again. And yeah, just pass her. Yeah. But that was that was much better. It read much clearer. Yeah. I think you can that was good. That was good. Maybe you jump at him more so it's just not out here, no? If you want it closer? Yeah. I think that's that's better. Yeah. One more time. That's better. Yes. Good. Do we have something somewhere close? a little problem with cueing the music here because it sounds a little bit similar in areas. One more time. And almost. yeah, almost. Okay. Get going, get going. So this could be like the way we see. J. Reynolds from midnight to 6 a.m. Harry Harrison from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Ron Lundy from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Steve O'Brien from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. Steve O'Brien from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. No, let's not go from beginning. Johnny Donovan from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. No, no, where is this from? Okay, so let's go back. Let's go on right here. Yeah, that's fine. You don't have to do it again. It was good. Right before we stop. So I think it's kind of, it's here. Ray Harrison from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Ron Lundy from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Steve O'Brien from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. Steve O'Brien from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. Johnny Donovan from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. I feel the earth move, I feel the tumbling down, tumbling down. There was a judge who like puts in a court in the judge who like, but in local jail. What it could be a spanking, or a whack, or a smack, or a swat, or a hit. This could be where of judges and courts and jails and who was it. This would be doing the facts of David Cassidy, or in this case of feelings that could make you happy, they could make you sad, they could make you mad, they could make you jealous. So do you know what jail okay, is, a judge I think we're not in the right place. place. That's okay. Good, 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 good. So, um, let me see the leaning. 
over here. And yeah, maybe maybe feel a little bit, should look a little nicer if you really, which arm is it? Yeah, just really let your head go and go a little, actually a little further rather than just making that position. And sh good, and now really high. Foof. Yeah, higher, higher, yeah. Hmm. What do we have? Yeah, and I think here you can give her a teeny bit more when she lands. You can, you can give her, yeah, give her, do you want to be, you don't want to be, you don't want to be here to get your leg, so you're not, so you're not like this way. It might be better if, if when he lands, yeah, if he takes you, if he gives you, boom, so then you can, okay. no, does that feel better? A little bit? No? Can do you can do anything. <laughs> she can do anything. Okay. Okay, good. Make sure that the, the, mov the movement has to be a little bit more. I know it's because the space is a little bit closer, but this, this, these things were, you, you know, that the things are really more different. So it, otherwise, it, it, it's a little bit too contained and it starts to look flat. Okay, so just all of show all the differences that, that we talked about. Uh, you know, we have, like when you have here, whoosh, pass over. Really, I forget what it is, but uh, boom. So it really, there's the release, and then it moves this way. Boom. This, is, this was good. Pa, 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 pa. Shum. Uh, maybe but that can move a little bit further. That's fine. Then it was, it's especially all this. So it's through the fingers, all the way. Up, and then we boom, create position again. Right? So remember to separate, like, each moment. Uh, with the quality is more uh, more interesting, yeah. Sure, we have no idea where we are in the music right now, <laughs> but there are very specific waves that we take and and use. Where are we? Do you have a mark? Tumbling down, tumbling down. I feel some ostriches are like into a satchel, some like. Well, what's the mark on the music? Is there a mark like a, a you know usually there's a there's a You should have like a name, you know. Thank you. Before the ballroom? Yeah, before before ballroom. Before ballroom, right here. Right before ballroom. Yeah, right before ballroom. Okay? Ballroom. I think it's this. And Wait, wait, wait. Johnny Donovan from 4.30 a.m. to 6 a.m. Now we go to some of the work. I feel the earth move. I feel the earth move. So this one will have eight in types into a pink rink. 
so this way could be very magic. So this would be like seeing a woman comes out to grab her, so this would she grabbed her. So this could be all the, the way, all the way. So this could be more if the earth moved or not. So here we go. I feel the earth move under my feet. I feel the tumbling down, tumbling down. I feel some ostriches are like into a satchel, some like them. I okay, let's go back. Let's go back. Let's work on that section. David let's work on this on the separation stuff. It's a little hard for David Hallberg to move big in this space. A little bit <laughs> early. <laughs> Too much. Right. So let's give you more room. Come down. Let's work on that. You know that moment that you separate, that you connect. Just just go through movement and really go through all all the fingers, all the way through the ceiling and everything. Yeah, just on the separation and. Good, a little more plie, a little more, change the, change the uh, angle, boom, that's right. Yeah, that's better, that's right. Now you go on. And boom. Okay, just let me see what we do, David, when you go away this way when you go to that corner yeah that's right just keep so so use this this more as opening opening through the space this way yeah but use your hands yeah one more time right that's it that's it that's it and dig through space shroom, shroom, on this, yeah, that's right. It really matters, it's, it, it's you're dancing at the same time and the eye really can go from a movement she's doing to one of yours, but the intensity and the clarity with which you do them is very, very important, okay? What do we have? That happens a few times. Okay. Yes, yes, I think that's right. That was very good. That was very good. Yeah. So this could be more if the earth moved or not. So here we go. I feel the earth move under my feet. I feel the tumbling down, tumbling down. I feel some ostriches are like into a satchel, some like them. Okay, I okay, went to the worry. window and wanted to draw the earth. So when David Cassidy tells you all of you to get on going, get going, get going, get going, so this could be like the WABC. Jay Reynolds from midnight to 6 a.m. Harry Harrison from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Ron Lee from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Steve O'Brien from 4 right. a.m. to 6 a.m. Steve O'Brien from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. Johnny Donovan from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. Maybe it's too tall for this space. <laughs> Okay, well, that's definitely not the right place in the music. Good, but that's good. Good, good, good. Okay. Good. That's good. Thank you. That's good. That's good enough. You'll have to see the whole thing to come. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, you're done. Thank you, Misty, because she's done. We'll have David. Maybe we'll start now with you that way. Yeah? And Devin. Yeah. Yeah, David, you're not done. Okay, good. Thank you, Misty. So, hi, Devin. So I have to, t I have to say quickly, I mean, I've, I have worked with the ballet theater years ago, and I hadn't in a while. And I'm so lucky to have, I have the most incredible group of dancers. I mean, but I have to say, the company has improved so much from dancing Alexei's work in the last years because there's a level of musicality and change of directions and all that, you know, that is now, it's just, they're just these miraculous dancers that have like the classical virtuosity, they're individuals, but they also have this, you know, beautiful relationship to music and way of, of, of the ability to change, change directions so fast and everything. So I feel very fortunate. So Devon and David, we're gonna show just a little bit of a, a duet they have in the third movement. Um, which has, is completely different. So, okay, right the, be, before the first part of it. <coughs>
good, 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 good. Very good. That's good. Good. Very good. Very, very nice. Um, still this little moment of the turn. Yeah. <coughs> but I think it's <laughs> just that one. Just use your hip. Oh. And there you go. That's it. That's it. That's great. So just to really, the more we emphasize the changes of speed and the moments that move and the moments that stop, the better. Okay, so let's um, maybe let's mark the beginning and then, and then catch up one more time. Okay? That's very good. A little more sound, maybe? Gradually we became aware of a home in the room. Yeah. Great. An electrical home. Beautiful. Thank you. Looks great. Awesome. Good. Thank you, David, very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Devin? Okay, let me do the, let's, you want to do your solo ones? Yeah? Let's do, let's do Devin's solo ones, and then we'll have the last couple. And so, yeah. So you see these quick changes of, of Tempe and, you know, all these different angles, and for me, it actually, I'm, it, to work, th these duets work quite well in the small space. I didn't make these duets. I forced myself not to just sort of fall into the pattern of like using this, the space in a very, very big way, but rather to focus on kind of specific shapes and, you know, changes of uh, dynamic a lot. Yeah? So let's do that. Yes. This one changes directions a lot, so hopefully. <laughs> Maybe it's the heart. to do that and to do it this well. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow in rehearsal. Yeah. I'm not changing anything. I'm not starting from scratch. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Great. You. So, <clears throat> so there's, this, there's a very specific idea to how the piece evolves, which I won't say anything about visually um, now. Uh, but there's the core actually I use in two moments in the last movement only. It's essentially this padecis for the principles. So the last couple tonight we will have Corey and Catherine. Where's Corey? Oh, there we are. Corey sings. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, let's just do that uh, little duet uh, after. Yeah, so the group comes out. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it was a murmur 
to say. Very good. Um, yeah, just this, to make sure that when you do the switch, it's really, it happens immediately. From here, you really just go down, she bounces you back to here, to that leads to your leg going, yes, that's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And keep this also circular into that uh, lift, yeah? Boom, yeah, and so we all see the arms from the back. So let's just see this. Pum pum. If you make, even that's right. Yeah. So you wanna you wanna bring your arm down and the head to go, go with it. Yeah, a little bit sooner. That's right. Let her bring you back. That's right. Yeah. You can turn turn your hand so you actually ha have his head. That's right. And that that you have the pull that 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 creates the pull to go this way. Yeah. That's right. Good. And finally, just a little bit more risk here. You know, you could, should really catch her as she jumps and pull her this way a little bit more. Yeah, that's right. Just up in the air, just that way. Should try it one more time. Last time. Sometimes it was a murmur. Sometimes it was a Sometimes it seemed good, to good. disappear, but then. Thank you very much. Um, I had one correction while I think of it. This is very good, but it'll come back tomorrow when I see you because I just forgot it. Okay, thank you so much. Very good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You know, you said life is short. It's amazing what you packed into your life so far. <laughs> Congratulations on this beautiful Thank work so far, much. and good luck with the premieres of both pieces. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you. Thank it. you very much. We wanted to get a third perspective about new repertory, and uh, I want to invite Marina Haas to join me just to talk about uh, new repertoire from the point of view of a dance lover, a dance writer, a dance critic. This is Marina Haas. John. Hi. So uh, you've seen a lot of dance in your time. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, in my long years. You're yeah. Very, <laughs> no, you're very short years. I'm a, a, yeah, I'm a dance writer, so mm -hmm. a dance critic and uh, a profile writer and features writer. So yeah, I, I see a lot of dance uh, around town. Yeah. And do you, you, uh, you've seen, when you come to ABT, you see the classics, you see performances, of course, of interesting artists. 
And you see some of the tuda and uh, yeah. I mean, what's um, what's wonderful about the repertory of ABT mm -hmm. is that you get um, you get a, an eclectic mix of mm -hmm. the classics and uh, something that I was always really interested in ABT was the 20th century classics right. also that uh, that you don't see in other places. Right. Um, right. Anthony Tudor and uh, Agnes de Mille right. and, and Twyla Tharp. And Twyla and Tharp, yeah. Yeah. So, and now, of course, you see a lot of Ratmansky, and you are writing a book about Alexei, right? I am writing right. a book about Alexei. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, since he became the, uh, the artist in residence, as, um, as Milpia said, uh, he, you know, he, he's really shaping the company in, right. his, in his image right. um, in, in, in some ways. But it's also really important that the dancers um, work with other choreographers, I think. Um, they need to be stretched in different ways. Right, which Yeah, is, this is, is completely different, yeah. a yeah. completely different style. Yeah, so you've seen a lot of new, new premieres. Um, can you talk about a couple of that you've seen that have really um, been important premieres that you think that will come back, maybe make classics, <sighs> modern classics? I mean, uh, there's so many. Um, I think one of the uh, the pieces that really struck me uh, was, and we talked about this yesterday too, was um, Ratmansky's Serenade after Plato's right. Symposium, right. which uh, just seemed like a new benchmark for the men in the company and um, actually for Ratmansky as well. I mean, right. it's a very different kind. Of, it's also being done this season. Right. It's a very different kind of ballet than I'd seen before. It's it's a essentially a Socratic dialogue right. in dance, yeah. which I, I didn't really know you could do. Right. Well, <laughs> but I mean, it did can anybody, be done. And, and he really did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you think this one will become a, a modern masterpiece? You know, it's, there's you no way to know. But I mean, it, it did feel, the premiere of that felt um, important. And right. every, every uh, cast I've seen makes it uh, its own and, and it seems to grow with each new cast. Right, so which is one of the tests of new rep, I think. When you see another cast in the work and whether it gives it a new a texture or if the piece deflates, yeah, as it exactly. were. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to seeing Her Notes again by Jessica right. Lange. I enjoyed that very much. That too. was made mm -hmm. last year, mm -hmm. I, I think. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there, there aren't enough uh, female choreographers being shown at the highest level in ballet companies. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's one, that's the sort of, um, you know, the social aspect of it, but, but really also just seeing a work by a, a choreographer who is um, very much in her prime um, and who works very well with the, the women in the company. Her point work is exquisite, right. so that'll be interesting. Right. Well, thank you very much for coming and sharing your perspective. Um, and thank you all for coming. Please do come see ABT season at the Coke Theatre, at the State Theatre, um, in a couple of weeks. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, all of the panelists, for being here tonight. I want to thank Emily as well, and thank the fabulous dancers at the ABT. Uh, we're going to, our finale tonight is the uh, Pas de Deux from 13 Diversions by Chris Wielden. The music is Benjamin Britten, and it's going to be danced by Gillian Murphy and Blaine Hoven.